This video is brought to you by Don't ever let them put you in a box. Don't ever let them predict your next move. And most of all, don't ever stop motivating them. Cool green clothing, top of the line men's bed oil, coming soon. Oh yeah, and by the way, if you ain't cool and getting the green, you're in the way. And that's just basic. I, I. It's your girl, Mrs. Tony Two Times, and I'm back with another episode of The Baltimore Way. In this video, I'll be taking it back to 2009 to discuss the tragic end to the disappearance of Jerry L. Maisha Foster with her baby's father as the primary suspect. But before we get into this video, please hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on any future uploads. And of course, feel free to share this video with everyone you know. Also, if you'd like to see more episodes of The Baltimore Way, please click the link to the playlist in the description box after this video to get caught up. All right, let's get into it. 23-year-old Jerry L. Foster, who went by her middle name, Maisha, was a mother of a two-year-old daughter with her boyfriend, 30-year-old Frederick Allen Christian. Jerry L. and Christian shared an apartment together on the first block of Hazy Morn Court in the Cockeysville Timonium area of Baltimore County. Jerry L. was very hardworking and worked at the same clothing store for three years. By 2009, she was already manager and had never missed a day of work. Frederick was a used car salesman and did okay for himself in the business of buying and flipping cars. The couple and their daughter seemed to be a loving and thriving family. Jerry L was also very close to her family and would visit her mother a few times weekly. Holidays and family gatherings were an important part of Jerry L's life. So when Thanksgiving came around in 2009 and Jerry L was a no-show at a family dinner, it was strange. It was even more unsettling for Jerry L's family when her boyfriend and daughter showed up to her family's home for dinner without her. Confused family members asked Frederick where Jerry L was and he responded that she had left for work the day before and she hadn't returned. He said he had no idea where she was. Jerry L's family members immediately contacted police and reported that she had been missing since November 25, 2009. The family told police about Frederick's odd behavior at Thanksgiving. Family members described him as extremely nervous they told police his hands were shaking so bad he couldn't feed the baby. Baltimore County Police quickly began their investigation into Jerry L's disappearance. And from the beginning, Frederick was their main person of interest. Family members revealed that the relationship between Jerry L and Frederick had hit a tailspin and Jerry L was no longer her happy and vibrant self. Everything seemed great in the beginning of the relationship, but Frederick became controlling and just two days prior to her vanishing, he struck Jerry L in the face, causing a black eye. Those close to Jerry L noticed the bruising on her face. However, Jerry L kept things to herself and never verbally told her family what was going on. Jerry L decided to handle things on her own and wanted Frederick to move out and to end things after he put his hands on her. But before that could happen, Jerry L suddenly went missing. As investigators talked to more witnesses, they spoke to Jerry L's neighbor, Paul, and he said that on November 28, 2009, on the day he found out Jerry L had disappeared, he asked Frederick what happened to the love seat under the front window of Jerry L's apartment where Frederick was still staying at the time. He said Frederick replied that he had thrown it away because he wanted to put his weight set in the living room. When a search of Jerry L's apartment was conducted, 
Detectives noticed that the love seat portion of a red sectional was missing from the living room. They also noticed bleach stains and powder cleaning substance on the carpets throughout the apartment. When detectives questioned Frederick about the bleach on the carpet and why he got rid of the love seat, he had no explanation. He maintained that he did not know where his girlfriend and the mother of his child was. Jerielle's family continued to hold out hope for her safe return. Days and weeks continued to go by and still no sign of Jerielle. Her family pleaded for information that would help bring Jerielle home. It was not like her to go away for this long without any contact with her daughter, mother, or family in general. She wouldn't just up and leave her life behind. She was very responsible and dependable. Meanwhile, as the search for Jeriel continued, police believed that Frederick was trying to cover his tracks and he knew more than he was leading on to. Even others close to Frederick started to feel like he was hiding something. An anonymous tip came in about the red love seat, but police were unable to follow up on it. Jeriel's case was named the red couch case because of that piece of evidence. Five months would go by before a major break in the case unfolded. On March 2, 2010, almost 200 miles away from Baltimore, in Stafford County, Virginia, an animal control officer was searching in the woods next to an off-ramp on I-95 for a German Shepherd that had been hit by a car. Partially obscured by leaves and branches, the officer noticed something that looked like a bundle of clothing. When the officer got closer, they had no doubt that they had just stumbled upon badly decomposing remains. The officer immediately called into dispatch for police to come out to the scene. The remains were identified as Jerry L. Foster. An autopsy revealed that Jerry L. lost her life as a result of gunshot wounds. Her passing was ruled a homicide. Two weeks after Jeriel was found, on Monday, March 15, 2010, Frederick Christian was arrested that night in Baltimore and charged with first-degree hit. Frederick went to trial for Jeriel slaying in April 2011. The prosecution called multiple witnesses, including members of Jeriel's family, the neighbor, who was at the time locked up on unrelated charges, a business partner of Frederick's, experts, and officials. They also laid the groundwork of circumstantial evidence that pointed to Frederick. The only thing the prosecution didn't have was the smoke and gun. They never recovered the weapon used in Jerry L's slaying. The motive the prosecutors presented was that Frederick was losing control of the relationship with Jerry L after she was going to kick him out of the apartment. They believe Frederick took Jerry L's life by shooting her and drove her body to Virginia and dumping her on the side of the highway 200 miles away. He then got rid of the love seat and bleached the carpets to discard crucial DNA evidence. Frederick, however, took the stand in his own defense. He maintained he did not know what happened to Jerry L. He said she was going to work on November 24, 2009 and simply vanished. His explanation in court about the bleach was that he was cleaning juice that his daughter had spilled. In court, he didn't have an explanation for removing the love seat from the apartment. He also reportedly had several outbursts in court. He would throw his hands up in frustration, and near the end of the trial, he told his lawyer he was fired. The judge said that could not happen at this stage of the trial, and Frederick asked to be excused from the courtroom, and he was escorted out. In closing argument, the defense urged the jurors to be skeptical of other witnesses' testimony. In the end, a jury convicted Frederick Christian of slaying Jerry L and weapons charges. He was later sentenced to life in prison 
plus 20 years without the possibility of parole. May Jeriel Maisha Foster continue to rest in peace. My belated condolences to her family. I couldn't imagine how tough it was for them not knowing what happened to Jeriel, especially her mother, who she was very close to. Jeriel's daughter didn't get a chance to grow up with her because of what her father had done. She would be 17 or 18 now. I hope that all is well with her and despite this horrible tragedy, she was able to have a good life. Frederick maintained his innocence to the end. What do you think happened in this case? Did the prosecution paint the right scenario? Did Frederick take Jeriel's life because he was losing control and the relationship was about to be over? In my opinion, based on the circumstantial evidence, I do believe that Frederick is responsible for slaying Jeriel, but ultimately, he hoped to get away with it if he continued to maintain his innocence. Jeriel, young, beautiful, and hardworking with her whole life ahead of her, was ready to be done with him. And I don't think he could handle that. I don't know if it was a crime of passion in the heat of the moment, maybe a possible argument led up to the fatal incident. Or was it plan? Why did it come to him ending her life? Fam, tell me your thoughts on this story in the comments below. All right, fam, that's it for this episode of The Baltimore Way. Thank you all so much for watching. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. This is your girl, Mrs. Tony, two times. Until next time.